Welcome to Discovery. We've been in a message series called Feeling Stuck. Because that's what many of you have told me. You're getting really tired of the shelter at home situation. You're feeling stuck in a situation that you never asked for. And the sad thing is that as we deal with the stress of this virus situation, we can end up taking it out on the people we care about the most, and we don't want to see that happen. So we've looked at topics like uh, kindness and love and patience, things that will help us in our relationships so that we won't hurt those that we care about. As we go through this situation, another thing that could be helpful is guidance or direction. I think many of us are looking for guidance or direction as we try to plan for the future. Many of us would like to look ahead to this summer or this fall and make plans, but we need some direction. Our church is blessed with two wonderful church camps, but will we be able to hold our weeks of camp this year or will there be some major changes? As we look to next fall, will our kids be able to return to school or will it be uh, distance education again? As we go through this time of uncertainty, wouldn't it be great if we had a guide? Wouldn't it be great if we could just ask our questions directly to God and he would just write the answer in the clouds? Jim Biosted posted his question on Facebook. Lord, please give me a sign if you think I'm eating too much. And wouldn't it be great if God would just write the answer in the clouds or at least give us a sign? But it seems that we never find the answer by looking in the clouds. I have a good friend who decided to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So once you make that crazy decision, how exactly do you climb that mountain? He could have had an attitude that said, well, it can't be that hard to climb. I've played King of the Mountain since I was a little kid, so I certainly know how to climb a mountain. And I've gone skiing at Afton Hill, so I've been on big hills before. This is just going to be a bigger hill to climb. If he had that attitude, it would have been a disaster. Climbing that mountain is a challenge. The top elevation at Elfton Alps is 700 feet. The top elevation at Mount Kilimanjaro is 19,341 feet. People go through intense training before they attempt climbing that mountain. My friend was wise and he hired an experienced guide to give him advice on the training and then the guide actually went with him on the journey up the mountain. The guide knew what supplies were needed, and he had experience with weather changes. The guide's advice led to a successful climb. So wouldn't it be great if we could get a guide for other parts of our life besides climbing mountains? If you're single and you're dating, wouldn't it be great if a guide could walk you through the dating process? No, 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 not that one. You should date this one instead. Or maybe you're married and you get in an argument with your spouse. Wouldn't a guide be helpful? Just when you're about to tell your spouse how much they're like their mother, the guide would step in and say, Stop, don't say that because you're going to end up sleeping on the couch again. We make important decisions all the time, and our bad decisions can have terrible consequences. Wouldn't it be great if we had a guide who would help us make decisions as we go through life. The Bible tells us that we do have that kind of a guide. The writers of scripture have many great names or pictures for God. He is a redeeming God. He is the creator God. He is a judge. He is the comforter. And our God is also a guiding God. God guided Abram when he was, called him to leave his country and go to a new land. And then when it was time for Israel to leave Egypt, we're told that the Lord would go before them, and do you remember how he would guide them? He did it as a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night. God was guiding his people. The psalm that most people know the best also talks about God being a guide. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. So what is God doing in this psalm? Verse 2 says he leads. Verse 3 says he guides. God knows exactly what you need in life, and he provides helpful guidance. 
When you move to the New Testament, the book of James says this in chapter 1, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. So when you face an important decision in your life, what should you do? Do you rely on your own wisdom or do you seek God's wisdom? My wisdom is so limited, so why would I rely on my own wisdom? God loves it when we come humbly before Him and seek His guidance and wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, we read this well-known scripture on God's guidance. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. So what does it mean to trust the Lord with all your heart? You might hear the bride say to the groom, I love you with all my heart. Or if an athlete is really dedicated to a sport, you might say that he goes at it with all his heart. It's a picture of total devotion or total commitment. This verse was written in Hebrew, and the word used for trust was taken by the Greek writers of the New Testament, and it became a salvation word. In the New Testament, we translate it as believe. It means to commit yourself totally to something. When you become a Christian, you are trusting God with your entire life, your mind, your heart, your soul, your present, and your future. Jesus has never disappointed anyone who placed their trust in him, so you're giving total devotion to this leader. Can you think of some songs that describe our total devotion to Jesus? I think of the old camp song that people would sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. That song is a beautiful picture of total devotion to Jesus Christ. In commenting on this verse, one writer said, When you decide to trust God with all your heart, then God will bring you up against some unsolvable problems and major obstacles and difficulties that seem to have no solution. In those situations, you will feel like you can't do anything but trust the Lord. When you run into those situations, make sure you trust the Lord and follow His guidance. You will come to a major fork in the road where the road of life will split, and there will be times when the road that goes to the right is a wide path, and it seems logical. And there are a lot of people who choose that path, and it looks like the easy path. And then you look at the road that goes to the left, and it looks like a much, much more difficult path. It has more obstacles. Very few people are choosing that path. And it feels like God is leading you down the more difficult path. And that's when you have to decide if you're going to trust the Lord. Will you choose the easy way or the hard way? In the New Testament, Jesus gave us this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, he said, You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. So our total devotion to God will lead us to take the more difficult path in life. It's a road that's difficult, but you will never, never regret taking that path. You can talk to any missionary who has chosen this path, and they will tell you, yes, the road has been difficult, but they have no regrets. Our scripture from Proverbs also tells us that we will find God's direction in life by acknowledging God in all we do, Look at verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So what does it mean when it says in all your ways acknowledge him? There are four different Hebrew words in the Old Testament that are translated as way. The word used here for way means a little goat trail that leads off the main trail. So what this is telling us is that God is not only interested in the major decisions you make in life, but he's also interested in those smaller decisions, those side details of your life. This doesn't mean that you have to check with God every day on which shoes to wear, 
But it does mean that God cares about each conversation that you have. Maybe you see that brief conversation that you have with the neighbor as really not that important. But God sees it as very important because you have an opportunity to acknowledge Him in everything you do. As a believer, once you give your life to God, the Bible says that Christ lives in you. So now, as you head down these side roads in life, or these goat trails in life, you're going to encounter people, and you will have the chance to let Jesus Christ shine through your life. It's important to ask yourself, what would Jesus want me to do? What would Jesus want me to say? How would Jesus want me to handle the situation? Maybe you see a Christian get on social media and blast everyone who disagrees with him. Is that really what Jesus wanted him to do? I don't think so. When you acknowledge Jesus in everything you do, you let the Holy Spirit lead you so that you treat people with love and kindness. As you acknowledge Jesus in these everyday decisions, then he promises to give you the direction that you need. As we go on through this shelter at home situation, not all of us, but many of us have more time on our hands. What are you going to do with all that extra time that you've been given? When I go on walks through my neighborhood, I see all sorts of people who are tackling home projects. They're busy with their lawn or they're cleaning out their garage. That's what they're doing with their extra time. What about you and me? What are we doing with our time? Ephesians 5 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So that scripture tells us to make the most of every opportunity. With the extra time that you've been given, you can nurture some important relationships. With social distancing, you can't drive over to another person's house and go visit in their living room but you can pick up the phone and have a nice conversation. You know, we used to say that we would make those phone calls, but there was just never enough time in the day. Well, guess what? Now we have the time. You can be a great source of encouragement to some people who are lonely or discouraged if you just pick up the phone. And God wants all of us to be good stewards with the time we're, we're given. You can use this extra time to simply binge watch on Netflix every night. Or you can use some of that time to dig deeper into God's Word. I'm not suggesting that you have to eliminate Netflix from your week. But I am suggesting there's great value in going deeper into God's Word. What would happen if you decided to read through the book of Philippians? It's only four chapters long. But you have Paul being stuck in prison as he writes that letter. He could have sat there feeling sorry for himself, but instead his letter is filled with joy. I think we all could learn a lot by reading that letter again. During this time, we can develop a deep love for God's Word, and that's such a good thing because that's where we find guidance. There's beautiful guidance the more we dive into God's Word. There's a great verse in 2 Timothy 3 that talks about the value of God's Word. But before we look at that verse, I want us to see what Paul says earlier in that chapter. Chapter 3, verse 1. You know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God. Paul warns Timothy that there will be difficult times. Today's scripture is timely because we find ourselves in difficult times because of this pandemic. So how should we live during these difficult times? Verse 14 says, You must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. 
So Paul issues this charge to young Timothy. He says, remain faithful to the things you've been taught. And that advice carries over to us today. We need to remain faithful to the things we have been taught. There's tremendous value and benefit when we develop a love for God's Word. It's going to teach us what is true. It's going to correct us when we're wrong. It's going to equip us to do good works. God is a good Father, and He gives us the freedom to make choices. John Ortberg says it can be helpful if we think about God's guidance in terms of the relationship that you see between parents and children. So here's a question for you. Would it be a good thing if a parent could make every decision for a child's whole life? Think about that question. Would it be a good thing if a parent could make every decision for a child's whole life? If you're a parent, would you like it? If for your child's whole life, you could say, wear these clothes, take this class, date this person, choose this major, buy this house, enter this job, and marry this person. Would you like that? My wife would answer yes to that question, but the correct answer would be no. Because what would that do for your child's development? If I'm a parent, my main goal for my child isn't to control every decision they make. My main goal is that he or she becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, and that they develop godly character that consists of wisdom and courage and grace and mercy and love and truth. Developing this godly character requires you to think things out and exercise some judgment. And sometimes you make difficult choices in the face of uncertainty. And then you take accountability and you learn. That process is indispensable for the formation of godly character. There are times when we go to God for guidance and his response will be to let us make our own choice. Because we will never grow if we don't have that freedom. Maybe you heard the story about the CEO who was taken on this new job. And the outgoing CEO said to him, Sometimes you're going to make wrong choices. It's just a fact of life that you're going to mess up and make some mistakes. When that happens, I have prepared three envelopes for you. I left them in the top drawer of the desk. The first time it happens, open envelope number one, and so forth. So for a while, everything goes fine, and then the CEO makes his first major mistake. He goes to the drawer, he opens up envelope number one, and the message reads, blame me. So he does. He says, this is the old CEO's fault. He made these mistakes, and I inherited all these problems. Everybody says, okay, so that works out pretty well. Things go fine for a while, and then he makes his second major mistake. So he opens up envelope number two. This time he reads, blame the board. So he does. He says, you know, it's the board's fault. The board has been a mess. I inherited them. They're the problem. Everybody says, okay, that makes sense. Things go fine for a while, and then he makes his third major mistake. So he opens up envelope number three, and the message he reads says this, prepare three envelopes. God is a good father and he gives us the freedom to make choices. There are times when we will make bad choices, but we can learn from those mistakes and come back to God. In the story of the prodigal son, the son made some terrible, terrible choices, but he learned from those mistakes, and the story ends with joy as he returns to the father. I want to close with this story that Ken Sandy told he said, one day during my morning run, I noticed a blind woman walking on the other side of the street with her seeing eye dog. It was a beautiful golden retriever. And as I was about to pass them, I noticed a car blocking a driveway a few steps ahead of them. At that moment, the dog paused and gently pressed his shoulder against the woman's leg, signaling her to turn aside so they could get around the car. I'm sure that she normally followed the dog's guidance, but that day she didn't seem to trust him. She had probably walked this route many times before, and she knew this was not the normal place to make a turn. Whatever the cause, she went moved to the side and instead gave him the signal to move ahead. 
The dog again pressed his shoulder against her leg, trying to guard her on, guide her on the safe path. She ordered the dog to go forward. When he again declined, her temper flared. I was about to speak up when the dog once more put his shoulder gently against her leg. Sure enough, she kicked him. And then she impulsively stepped forward and she walked straight into the car. Reaching out to feel the shape in front of her, she immediately realized what had happened. Dropping to her knees, she threw her arms around the dog and spoke sobbing words into his ear. I like that story because I think that gives us a pretty good picture of how we sometimes treat the guidance that God is trying to give to us. Our God is a God who guides. And day after day, he's there to guide us because he loves us, he cares for us, he wants to protect us, he wants what's best for me, he wants what's best for you. So remember, our God is a guiding God. Guiding God. Make sure you accept his guidance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that you give us guidance and direction. Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we admit that this is a challenging situation. We need your direction. We need your guidance. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when our hearts are hard and stubborn and we ignore you. I pray in those times that we will have the wisdom to repent and come back to you and trust you to guide us like the good shepherd that you are. I thank you that you are faithful. I thank you that we can trust you with our present and with our future. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.